Hi everyone, welcome to your lesson on Bond's Enthalpy and Hess's Law as part of week 9, day 1 of your learning in higher chemistry. Okay, so today we're continuing the chemical energy topic. Last week we were learning about enthalpy of combustion um, and a, an introduction to the topic. And today we're going to add um, a few more aspects of chemical energy to our understanding. Okay, so while you're working through these slides, um, make sure you've got your notes jotter handy so you can take notes and you might also want to have your 3B booklet handy as well um, or just the electronic copy if you've not got a paper copy yet. Okay, so as always, um, you've got your learning outcomes in the booklet, you've got notes and questions on the topic as well. So we've got a few learning outcomes that we're working through today um, from the chemical energy topic. The main part of our lesson is going to be on the topic of bond enthalpy, which covers the last two um, learning outcomes on the screen. But we will also do a little introduction to something called Hess's Law, but we will spend a bit more time on this um, in our second lesson this week as well. Okay, so we're going to start looking at um, what's called bond enthalpy. So we know that um, enthalpy of combustion, which we were looking at last week, is a good way of measuring the enthalpy change in certain chemical reactions. So once we're obviously you're able to burn a sample of the substance and measure the energy that's released um, from that process. But we can't do that with um, all substances. And there might be certain chemical reactions where we can't use something like enthalpy of combustion to measure the enthalpy change. And this is where um, another measure of chemical energy called bond enthalpy can be helpful to us. So bond enthalpy is all to do with the energy stored inside chemical bonds. So we know that there is chemical potential energy inside chemical bonds. And during chemical reactions, the bonds have to be broken and then new bonds have to be made. And there's energy associated with the bonds um, that we're making and breaking. So there are measured values for the enthalpy associated with different kinds of chemical bonds, um, which we'll have a look at later on. And basically we are able to use those values of bond enthalpy to um, kind of estimate the enthalpy change in a chemical reaction. Okay, so if we look at an um, example chemical reaction here, this is not something you would need to take a note of, but if we have a look at um, the potential energy involved, so on the y-axis of our graph, and remember what we call the reaction pathway, so moving through the reaction from reactants to products. The example reaction we're going to look at is between um, this chemical here called ethane, C2H2. It's carbons with a triple bond between them. So similar to ethene, but um, with three bonds between the carbons. And our ethane is reacting with hydrogen gas. Okay, so two moles of hydrogen uh, to balance that equation as you'll see when we look at the product side. So in this reaction, but in any chemical reaction that we look at, what we would have to do, first of all, before we can make the products, is we have to break all of the bonds within the reactant molecules. So the triple bond between the carbon atoms, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogens, and the bond that exists between those diatomic hydrogen molecules, all of those bonds get broken and that requires us to put in energy. Um, so bond breaking is what we call an endothermic process because energy has to be put in. And depending on what type of bond you've got, slightly different amounts of energy will be required. So we have to break all those bonds. So however much energy that requires, we need that energy from somewhere. That would be part of the consideration of our activation energy. Then we've got all of our free atoms and then we can move on to looking at the 
product side of our equation. So in order to form our product or products, we have to make new bonds between the atoms and arrange them in a different way. And when we do that, um, in this particular reaction, we make ethane, so C2H6. So we're joining those two carbons now with a single bond. We're looking at um, three, six sorry, bonds between carbons and hydrogens to make up um, the entire molecule. And when we're forming those new bonds, that is an exothermic process. So once bonds are made, energy is released. And again, depending on the type of bond you're making, slightly different amounts of energy would be released. So one way that we can think about the enthalpy change in an overall reaction is we can look at the energy involved in breaking bonds, first of all, and making new bonds. So we can look at um, measured values of bond enthalpies, the energy stored in different types of bonds. We can work out what's the total amount of energy we need for all the bonds we have to break in the reactants. Then we can work out what's the total amount of energy released from all the bonds that we make in the products. And if we look at the balance um, of energy overall, then we can work out if the reaction is exo or endothermic, and we can also put a value to that as well. So it is a different way of working out the enthalpy change of a reaction, um, but it's one that's pretty helpful. There's quite a lot of bond enthalpies that are measured um, that you'll find in your data book that we'll take a look at um, and we can use those to get a good idea of the enthalpy change involved in lots of different reactions. Okay, so um, first bit of notes for you to take down today. You should know that all chemical reactions involve breaking and making bonds and as we just looked at in the example, any type of bond breaking, no matter what bond it is, is always endothermic. So we always need to put energy in to break bonds. But then when we make bonds, that's an exothermic process. So energy is always released in that process. But remember, it's the balance of energy overall that decides whether your reaction is endo or exothermic. So um, when we look at bond enthalpies, there are um, slightly different definitions of bond enthalpies that can be measured. So you need to know what these definitions are and you need to know what the difference is between them. So the first type of bond enthalpy we're going to look at is something we call molar bond enthalpy. So these are all values that are measured per one mole of a substance or one mole of bonds, I should say. So molar bond enthalpy is the energy that we need to break one mole of bonds in a diatomic molecule. So this could be for something like hydrogen, the H2 molecule. There's the bond between the two hydrogen atoms, um, and we can see that bond breaking there to give the two individual hydrogen atoms. And this particular um, bond breaking between the two hydrogen atoms needs 436 kilojoules per mole. And you see the positive sign um, at the start there just reminding us that that's an endothermic process that we're having to put energy in in order to break that bond. Okay, so these um, bond enthalpy values, because we're talking about a diatomic molecule, that means two atoms, like hydrogen, with one bond between them. Or maybe in some cases, like with um, oxygen, it might be a double bond between them. But basically, those two atoms only have that one bond to break. There's no bonds to other atoms that they can form. So that value will always be the same. A bond between two hydrogens that's the only bond they have, um, and that bond will always require 436 kilojoules per mole. 
to be broken. Now what we'll see when we think about other kinds of bonds, unlike the HH bond and hydrogen, is that they form in different kinds of molecules and that has an effect on how much energy um, is needed to break the bond. But these molar bond enthalpy values, these are for diatomic molecules. Okay, so these are exact values. It is exactly 436 kilojoules per mole every time we break one mole of those bonds. Okay, so what I was saying to you there was there are bonds that occur in lots of different molecules. Um, and a really good example of that is the carbon to carbon single bond. So you could have carbon to carbon single bond in an alkane. It could be part of an alkene along with a double bond. It could be in an alcohol. It could be in an ester. It could be in an aldehyde or a ketone. There's loads of different um, what we call environments or types of molecules that that bond could be found in. And what we find with bond enthalpy values, um, if you've got, so say like your two carbon atoms can form other bonds as well as that single bond between them. So depending on what other bonds they have, depending on whether it's like a, a CH that's connected or a double bond to an oxygen or an OH, depending on the other bonds um, in the molecule, connected to those carbon atoms, that has an impact on the amount of energy required to break that carbon to carbon bond. So in an alkane, it might take a certain amount of energy to break that CC bond, but in an alcohol, it might take a, it would take a slightly different amount of energy. Now, they're not huge differences, but they are differences. And it is important that we take account of them. So for any bonds like the CC bond that can appear in lots of different molecules, what we have are what's known as mean bond enthalpies. So these are average values taken account of, so they've been measured in lots of different molecules and it takes account of the slight variation in the bond enthalpy for that particular bond. So these values are not going to be the exact value necessarily for your um, the bond in your your molecule because it's an average value but it's the best way that we have of um, taking account of that because it's quite difficult when you get more complex molecules it's quite difficult to work out you know the exact amount of that bond because it is affected by the other ones around it so using this average value gives us the best kind of estimation that we can without making it too complicated to work it out. Okay, so I've just summarised that for you to note down. This is your definition. So mean molar bond enthalpy. So it's just got that extra word at the top at the start, mean, to show you it's the average. It's the average energy required to break one mole of bonds for a bond that occurs in a number of compounds. So like your carbon to carbon single bond, on average, that takes 348 kilojoules per mole. Now that number will vary slightly, depending on where the bond is, what else is connected, but that's the average value that we're gonna use for any calculations. Okay, uh, you will notice as well, you might have noticed in the last example of hydrogen, these um, equations that I'm putting up for showing you the bonds breaking are all in the gaseous phase because that's how these bond enthalpy values are measured. So they're measured for gas phase reactions um, with the reactants in the gaseous state. Um, it's not really something you'll get asked to write equations to represent. Um, well, you might see them maybe in a multiple choice question, but um, all of the reactions you might get asked to calculate this for will be in the gas phase because that's how these values are measured. Okay, so I have mentioned values quite a bit um, in the previous slides and you do have 
a page in your data book with bond enthalpy values, so both the molar bond enthalpy and the mean molar bond enthalpy values. All of them are found on page 10 of your data book. So if you've got your data book there, um, you can have a look at finding this page just now, page 10. If you don't, you can have a look at the electronic copy um, or just trust me that this information is on page 10. Okay, so you can see that the, there's two separate tables. So you've got a table with the bond enthalpy values. So these are the exact values for those diatomic molecules. So you can see all of these molecules, the bond we're looking at is the only bond that would exist. So like in HCl, there's only that one bond joining the atoms together. You could never get that bond within a molecule joined onto anything else because those atoms um, are at capacity, they've reached full outer shells. Whereas um, in the other table, you've got your mean bond enthalpies and there's um, quite a few examples of these. Lots of them are different types of carbon bonds um, and they're the ones you would use the most in examples. So there's your carbon to carbon single bond. You've got a double bond, a triple bond. This one here that says aromatic, this is to do with when you have ring structures of carbon, like benzene, um, you won't really use that much, if at all. I mean, you've also got some bonds like the CH bond, that's quite a common one that you would use, CO or C double bond O, some bonds with um, halogens and carbon, and you've got things like hydrogen oxygen, hydrogen nitrogen as well. So when we're looking at using bond enthalpies to work out the enthalpy change for a reaction, you will most of the time be going to page 10 of the data book to get the values that you need. Um, they are sometimes given to you in a table in the question, but usually you've got to get them from the data book. So part of the kind of challenge of working out bond enthalpy in this way is making sure that you're selecting the right values. Okay. So how do we use these values to actually work out the enthalpy change for a reaction? So it's fairly simple. What we essentially need to do um, is look at the, the two stages of the reaction. So going back to that very first example, we need to think about all the bonds that we are breaking in the reactants and then think about all the bonds we are making in the products. And you can put this in an equation if you like your, your maths. You can use um, the symbols that I've used here, although you don't have to remember this equation um, in this form at all. But what this equation basically says is delta H is the sum, so that's the um, sigma, capital sigma there, the sum of the delta H values for all the bonds broken, so that's all the bonds we're breaking in our reactants, all the enthalpy values of those summed up, and then minus all the enthalpy values for the bonds that we make, um, and that will be in the products. So just going back to the, the data book for a wee second, all of the values in the data book are given as endothermic, so positive values. But remember that um, it's only bond breaking that's endothermic. When we make bonds in the products, it's exothermic. So they would actually be negative energy be released. So the way we're going to take account of that is with that little subtraction that we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to keep the values from the data book positive, use those positive values for the bonds broken sum those up, use the positive values for the bonds made, sum that all up. But then when we do the subtraction between them, that's us taking account of the fact that making bonds is exothermic. Okay, so doing that subtraction is how you're going to take account of that. So if you don't like um, the kind of mathematical equation here, basically what we're thinking and what we're doing is taking the bonds broken once we've added up all the values for those and subtracting the values for the bonds made. So broken minus made, 
It's a little simple way to remember it. Um, or you can use this form of the equation if you like, but you don't have to. Okay, so we're going to have a look at an example calculation. So make sure you note this down in your jotter. So you've got an example to look back at. So this is quite a typical question. It's telling us in the question to use bond enthalpy values from the data book to calculate the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole for the following reaction. And they've given us a balanced equation for the reaction. Now, in this example, we just have the balanced equation. Sometimes you will have a formula equation drawn out for you with all the structures. But this um, example, we don't. Okay. And one of the things which you have to be really careful with for bond enthalpy questions is making sure that you know what the bonds are within the molecules that you have to break. Because if you don't know what the bonds are, or you get that bit wrong, you're going to get the wrong values from the data book, and then your whole calculation is going to be wrong. So if you get a question like this, where you can't actually see the bonds because the molecules aren't drawn out, then the first thing you have to do to make sure you get all those bonds correct is draw out those molecules, okay? So you wanna draw out the structures of the molecules in the equation so that you can see exactly what bonds are there and you know what bonds are being broken and what bonds are being made. Now this will be done for you in some questions. If you get given that equation drawn out, that's fine. Um, but if not, you need to do that yourself, just so you're really clear on what those bonds are. So this is um, like the example we looked at at the very start of the video. This is ethane, C2H2. Any questions that you'd get asked to draw out would be molecules that you are familiar with. Um, so ethane's not that one, but I've shown you what this is in this case. We've got two moles of H2. So looking at the balance of numbers is important because we're going to have to break two moles of bonds for H2. And then we've got one of our C2H6 ethane products. So now that we've drawn out the structures, what we need to do in the next stage is we need to count up all the bonds that we have to break. So what different bonds we have what different types of bonds and how many of each and then get their enthalpy values from the data book and total up um, so that we can do that final little subtraction between the two. So sometimes you'd be starting at this step if we didn't have to do the first part um, but you're always going to go through this stage. We need to work out a total for all the bonds being broken and a total for all the bonds being made. So the way I would suggest you do this is if you set up kind of two headings in your jotter, so bond breaking or bonds broken, however you want to label it. And under that heading, I'm going to list all the different types of bonds I've got and how many of each. And I'm going to go to the data book and get their bond enthalpy values. So in our um, ethane molecule, so you can refer back to the drawing from the previous slide. We've got one of these carbon to carbon triple bonds. So from the data book, that's 838 kilojoules per mole. I'm just going to miss out the units here because um, all we're doing is adding up these values. So we don't really need units at the minute. Still thinking about the ethane molecule, we've got two carbon to hydrogen bonds. So the value for that bond is 412 kilojoules per mole, so two times that gives us 824. Then thinking about our other reactant, we've got two of those HH molecules. So the value for that bond is 436 kilojoules per mole, or times it by two because there's two of them, to get 872. And that's us done all the bonds in the reactants. So all we're going to do is just total that. So just add everything together. And that comes to 2,534 
kilojoules. So that is our total for all the bonds that we have to break in the reactants. So now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it for all the bonds being made in the product. Okay, so heading over to other side of your daughter, another heading, bond making. Again, looking at our um, structure that we've drawn out. So in the ethane molecule, there's one carbon to carbon single bond, which is 348 kilojoules. And there's six carbon hydrogen bonds, so 412. You see, we already had that value um, over on the reactant side. You could use it from there if you realize that it's over there, or you can just look up again. Um, so six times that, which is 2472. And then again, once we know we've taken account of all those bonds, we're just going to total that, which gives 2820 kilojoules. Okay, so this bit of work in here, this is really important to show a marker, show an examiner, what bonds you've identified in the molecule. So exactly like I've done here, listing out the types of bonds that we're using and noting down the enthalpy values from the data book. If you just give that total number at the end and say you get that total wrong, you're going to get no credit whatsoever for the question. Okay, these are normally worth two, maybe three marks, but it's quite a tricky one of a calculation. It's not a hugely difficult calculation. All we're doing is multiplying and adding things together and subtracting them at the very end. But it is easy to go wrong with picking out a wrong bond enthalpy value or missing um, a bond out of your molecule or picking, doing the multiplication wrong. It's easy to make mistakes. So you want to make sure that you're writing out your work in, showing what values you're using so that if something does go wrong, you're getting a hopefully partial credit for your calculation um, if you can't get all the marks. Okay, so please make sure you do this sort of working um, to show where the numbers are coming from. Okay, so now we've got our totals, we've got our total bond breaking, we've got our total bond making. So final thing is just to use those values to work out delta H. So I'm just using a simplified version of the equation I showed you earlier. What we're doing now is with our total, our totals from the previous slide, we're taking the broken bonds and we're subtracting the bonds that we're making. So broken minus made, that is 2534 minus 2820, which gives us minus 286 kilojoules per mole as our final answer. Now, unlike um, enthalpy of combustion, when that was always an exothermic reaction, you'll see this particular reaction we've looked at is also exothermic, which is why the delta H has come out in a negative number. But it's possible that you could ask to work out um, enthalpy change using bond enthalpies for an endothermic reaction as well. So as long as you've done your calculation correctly, and you remember to do this final step with the subtraction, the value you get out of your calculator will be exactly what you use as your final answer. So you're not going to stick a negative sign in front of it like we did with enthalpy of combustion. That was just for that calculation. Here, we're just going to stick with whatever our calculator said, if it's negative or if it's positive. The number we get is the exact final answer. Okay, so that is um, your example of a bond enthalpy calculation. Mathematically, as I said, it's not hugely tricky, but it's just a case of carefully taking your time to go through the working. The questions don't vary a huge amount on this. As I said, sometimes you will get given the structures drawn out, in which case it's a little bit easier for you. Trickier questions like this one will ask you to identify the bonds yourself and draw out the structure yourself. But that's really um, as tricky as it gets. So I'm not going to give you another example to work through um, for your notes because they're all very similar. But um, 
what I have put here is a link to a video of some other um, example calculations on YouTube. So if you want to just watch another couple of questions being worked through, then you can pause this video, you can leave this video, go and watch the bond enthalpy calculations, maybe look at a couple more examples, and then you can come back to this video when you're finished and when you're ready. Okay, there's no need to write any extra examples in your notes unless you want to. Um, this one example is enough um, to show you how this calculation works. Okay. So that is bond enthalpy. We've looked at the definitions of your molar bond enthalpy and your mean molar bond enthalpy. And we know how to use bond enthalpy values to calculate an enthalpy change. So this is the main part of our learning today. But what I wanted to introduce you to during today's lesson is the, the final um, concept in the chemical energy topic which is something that we call Hess's law. Okay, so this is um, a law which is to do with chemical reactions, but it's based on something called the law of conservation of energy, which um, if you do physics, I'm sure you're very familiar with. If you don't do physics, um, you should still kind of have an awareness of this concept from like first and second year science. So what this um, law of conservation of energy is all about is it tells us that energy can't be created or destroyed, but what we can do with it is we can change it from one type to another. So if you are um, putting bread into a toaster, you're putting electrical energy into the toaster, there's heat energy coming out to heat the bread and turn it into toast. There's potential energy involved because of the spring mechanism in the toaster. There's maybe some sound energy when the toaster springs back up and the toast pops out. So one or more types of energy are putting, being put into that situation. One or more types of energy are coming out. But even though we've got these different kinds of energy, the overall amount of energy is going to be the same. It's just getting transferred into different types. So there is no way of creating new energy out of nothing or destroying energy completely. All we're doing uh, with any kind of appliance or anything that uses energy, all we're doing is changing it from one type to another. So what we have in Hess's law is an application of this concept to chemical reactions. So we're thinking about how energy is conserved in chemical reactions. So when we do a reaction, we're not creating new energy. We're not destroying energy. We're just changing uh, the chemicals from one chemical into another. So we're maybe changing the amount of energy that is stored within the chemicals, depending on the types of bonds that are in them. But energy is not created or destroyed in that process. Energy would be released if it was an exothermic process or energy would be taken in if we needed more energy. Um, but overall, the energy is being conserved in, in that reaction. So this is helpful to us when we think about trying to work out enthalpy changes for reactions because basically what it means so this is the kind of definition of Hess's law Hess's law states that the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is independent of the route taken um, it was proposed by um, Russian scientist here, Jermaine Hess uh, back in times, I don't know exactly when, but when pictures look like this rather than photographs. So what this basically means is if we are going from chemical A to chemical B, we might go directly from A to B. So that's a bit like 
the little cartoon here showing you a person kind of jumping across this hole. We could go directly from A to B and that would take a certain amount of energy or enthalpy if we're talking about a chemical reaction. Or maybe we don't go directly, maybe we go from A to some kind of other substance C and then from C we turn that into B. So rather than going direct from A to B, we might go A to C and then C to B. We've still done the same overall change because we've still started at A and ended at B, but we've just done it in two steps rather than one. And what that means, so the A to C, C to B would be like doing the second route down here. So kind of sliding down uh, the hill and then crawling back up the other side. Each of those routes of the chemical reaction, or each of those pathways, would require the same enthalpy change overall. So if A to B was minus 200 kilojoules per mole, then whatever it took to go from A to C, and then from C to B, would also be minus 200 kilojoules per mole. So, this is very helpful to us if we have a kind of unknown um, step in a reaction pathway because we can kind of think of alternative routes in order to work out what that unknown is. So if we look at this in a more kind of chemical sense, to show you the example I was talking about. So there's route one, your direct route from A to B, has a particular enthalpy change associated with it, which we're going to describe as delta H1. Okay. And then here's our alternative route, route two. So that is going from A to C, which has an enthalpy change, delta H2, we're labeling this. And then going from C up to B. And that has it's another enthalpy change, delta H3. So for the whole of route two to get from A to B via C, is gonna be the sum of these two enthalpy change values. So according to Hess's law, what that means is whatever this value is, delta H1, that is going to be equal to delta H2 plus delta H3. So the enthalpy change in a reaction is the same regardless of the route that we take, or the enthalpy change is independent of the route taken. So if we had an unknown, say we didn't know what delta H1 was, maybe this is a chemical reaction that we can't do directly, or it's not easy to do directly, and work out this value. Maybe it's easier to do this route, so we could work out these values, and then we know what our missing unknown value is, because we know it must be the same overall. Okay, so this principle is very helpful to predict enthalpy changes for reactions that um, are difficult to do or maybe we're not able to do, depending on the chemicals involved. If we have an alternative route and we can measure the enthalpy change for that, that's where Hess's law becomes really useful. So what we're seeing in the chemical energy topic is just different ways that we have of working out the enthalpy change of a reaction. Um, some cases you might use enthalpy of combustion. That may be the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it might be bond enthalpies, or other times you might be using an application of Hess's law. Okay, so let's look at a kind of example question. Um, so you've got a similar kind of setup to what we had in the diagram a minute ago, but um, slightly more complicated. There's more steps involved and we've got some delta H values given to us. This is sometimes a question that we'll find like in a multiple choice situation, or you could find this sort of diagram in section two as well, but what we'll see on um, our second lesson this week is there's slightly more complex calculations we can do with Hess's law than just using these sort of diagrams. So those more complex questions are more often in section two or paper two, um, but this sort of diagram and this sort of question you could see in a multiple choice 
So we are to use the information in this diagram to find the enthalpy change for the reaction to change Z into Y. So we are working out this missing value here for this arrow. Okay, and as we can see in the diagram, we don't know this value. Okay, it's missing. But what we do have is three other values in the diagram. So what we have to do, looking at the diagrams, we have to find an alternative way of getting from Z to Y. We don't know what the value is directly, but if we can find an alternative route to get from Z to Y, using the delta H values that we've been given, then we can work out the enthalpy change because we know this direct step will be the same as the indirect step or the indirect route as long as we use these values correctly. So the important thing here is we think about the direction of the arrows in the diagram. So if we want to work out Z to Y, then looking at our diagram, we're going to have to start with Z and we're going to have to go to W first. But if you notice this delta H value is for W to Z, is minus 210 kilojoules per mole. But we don't want to do that, we want to do the reverse. We want to go from Z to W. So we know that um, delta H in a reaction, forward reaction and reverse reaction, it's the same quantity, but it's a different sign. So it's going to be the reverse of this delta H, which means that 210 is going to become positive when we go in the other direction. Okay, so that we've got to change that value just to reflect the fact we're going the other way. So we're going to do the reverse of W to Z because we're going Z to W. But then we would want to go W to X, okay, which is as labelled in the diagram, minus 50. And then from X, we're going to go to Y and that's minus 86. So the only value we're actually changing is the first one here because we're changing it to go from Z to W. The other two values we can use as they are because the arrows are pointing in the direction that we want to go. Okay, so if you're using this sort of diagram, it's just about changing the arrow round. Um, if you need to, if you're going in the other direction and when you change the direction of the arrow, you have to change the sign. Okay, so then we take our values. So it's now positive 210. We're adding these together, but we're adding a negative 50 and then we're adding negative 86. So altogether, that's 210 minus 50 minus 86, which gives us plus 74 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that would be our missing value here. And what you could do once you've worked that out, if you wanted to double check, you could look at trying some other routes. So you could try and look at working out, you know, this value here. So if you do Z to Y, and then Y to X, and then X to W, it should add up to that value if we've done this part correctly. Okay, so as I said, there is um, more complex calculations to Hess's law. So we've not done all of Hess's law today, we've just done a little introduction, um, but we will deal with those more complex calculations in our second lesson this week, okay? So, if we just take a little look now um, back at our learning outcomes, so as I said to the start, and just a minute ago, we have done some of these Hess's Law, so we know a definition of Hess's Law, um, and we do know one way that we can use Hess's Law to work at an enthalpy change, but there are there is more we can do with it, which we'll see in um, our second lesson this week. And we've covered those final two um, learning outcomes to do with the bond enthalpies. Okay, so what you're going to do for um, lesson two today, once you've finished up with this video and your notes, you're going to get a chance to practice some questions on what we've learned today. So there are some questions from the Unit 3B booklet on bond enthalpy calculations and on this first part of Hess's Law that we've looked at. You can take your time. There's a 
whole list of questions. Don't worry if you don't get them all finished. Just try as many as you can in the time you've got. And there are answers um, on Teams for you to mark these yourself. When you're working through those questions, just make sure um, you leave yourself maybe about 20 minutes or so at the end of lesson two to do the final task of today, which is a Microsoft Forms quiz, which is on everything we've done in chemical energy so far. So Hess's law and bond enthalpy from today, but also a little bit to do with enthalpy of combustion that we started last week. So the Microsoft Forms quiz is the work that you need to submit today. You don't have to upload any photos of your work to show my homework. But what we need you to do is to do the Microsoft Forms quiz. So make sure you leave yourself enough time to do that. But try some booklet questions first to make sure you've got the hang of the calculations. Okay? Um, because you can do the booklet questions, check your answers, make sure you've got the hang of it. And then final task is the Microsoft Forms quiz. Okay? So um, hopefully you've enjoyed your lesson today. Don't forget that during your lesson time, um, Mrs Smith will be available on Teams. So if you are trying some of the booklet questions and you're getting a bit stuck, um, or you check the answers and you're not sure why that's the answer, just pop onto Teams um, and you can ask Mrs Smith or you can um, put a comment on show my homework or email um, your own class teacher if you wish instead. Okay. So, that's it from me for today. Um, I will see you back here towards the end of the week. Bye.